Greetings. It's time for uh, the last of the main videos for lecture two, and then there will be the optional like solving video and the thing with the sock in the balloon, and everybody wants to see that. Okay. Um, what's next? Acid fast bacteria. So these end up being important in healthcare, um, in clinics. These are bacteria that you cannot gram stain, they just don't show up because they have a waxy outer layer that repels the gram stain dyes. So the pigments that we normally use in the gram stain don't stain these cells. So we have a special technique called the acid fast staining, and um, this is how you would see mycobacterium, like tuberculosis causing bacteria, in under the microscope. Uh, so if you suspect tuberculosis, I think one of the things you might do is do an acid fast stain on some um, something, some coughed up mucus. I'm blanking on what the term for that is. Anyway, um, they have mycolic acids, and if you've done organic chemistry or if you've seen this kind of um, chemical structure before, You'll remember that every time this line bends, that's a carbon with two hydrogens, another carbon with two hydrogens, and these are all covalently bonded. If you haven't seen these before, don't worry about it. Um, I'm just showing you if you do know how to read this kind of structure, this is what those um, waxy molecules are on the outside of one of these cells. They have um, these have a carboxylic acid and a hydroxyl group um, that would be embedded in the membrane, and then a long, long waxy tail. So the acid fast stain looks different from the gram stain, but it's the same basic idea where um, acid fast cells will hold on to the stain and any others will not. So it stains that waxy layer and they keep the stain in that waxy layer. The cells that don't have the waxy layer lose it. So the cells that are not acid fast, you decolorize them, they become invisible, and you have to counter stain them to make them visible, just like with the gram stain. With the gram stain, crystal violet sticks to the peptidoglycan of gram positives. Um, you put ethanol on, it removes the crystal violet from gram negatives, so they become invisible, and then safranin makes them visible. It's just the colors are different. Acid fast cells are kind of reddish purple. These, I think, are mycobacterium. Yeah, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and all the other ones would be counterstained with methylene blue, so they are blue. Okay, that's the acid fast stain. Um, flagella are a thing that bacteria have. These are the little propellers that they use to swim. So these would be um, kind of stiff protein corkscrews that get spun very quickly. And the idea is they push the cell through the water. Um, the trick here is that the bacteria are so small that they experience water very differently from the way we do. To a bacterium, the surface tension in water is much more important than the viscosity of water. And if that didn't make sense, don't worry about it. To a bacterium, water, swimming through water is like pushing through honey. Like a fish can't swim through honey. If a fish flapped its little flipper, it would go forward, but then it would go backwards again because honey would push it backwards. It's, um, it's just a different kind of fluid situation. And so to get through honey, you would need a propeller or a corkscrew. And so that's what um, bacteria have for getting through water at the tiny little scales that bacteria are on. Um, they spin really fast. Like they can spin, I think, 16,000 RPM, if you know what RPMs are. doesn't matter, but they use them for motility. Um, and one of my friends from grad school runs a lab now, and he has a cool web thing that's going to show you um, what I'm going to explain here. So um, they spin, and... The idea is if they're spinning in the right way, they're pushing the cell forward, if they turn around and get reversed, they make the cell tumble in a random direction. So when they're spinning counterclockwise, the cell moves forward. If it changed to clockwise, the cell spins randomly. This is how they steer. 
They can't turn left or right or up or down. They can only either go forward or spin into a random new direction. Think about getting through the world like that, where you can't turn except randomly. So if you're trying to get to something, you start out moving in some direction. If you don't like the direction, you roll the dice and move in the next direction. And if it's towards the thing you want, great. But if it's not, you're going to roll the dice again and move in a different direction. Um, so this is a very tricky thing to figure out. But the idea is bacteria don't have ways to steer and they don't have brains and they don't have nerves. All they can do is sense chemicals. They can sense molecules and they have ways of detecting whether a concentration of a molecule is increasing or decreasing. So if they notice that the concentration of something good is increasing as they swim forward, they will tend to run more and tumble less. Because if they see that concentration is increasing, they're actually going towards the source. And so they're going to tend to want to go farther towards the source. Um, if the concentration of the good thing doesn't increase, they'll tumble. And that's what this um, is supposed to show. But really, um, I do recommend you go to that link, and this is what you're going to see. And if you click the button, that's all you do is you keep clicking this button. At first, you're seeing lots of little cells swimming and if you look at any one of them you're going to see it swims for a while and then it randomly changes direction and then as you click through it kind of explains it and then this is a chemical gradient and you will see they swim towards it but the only way they do is by randomly either running or tumbling it's cool um, that lab actually produced a, a game where you tried to move a bacterium through a maze using running and tumbling, and they ended up taking it down because it was so frustrating to try to move the cell just by clicking tumble. That's the only control you had, click tumble, and try to get the cell through a maze. Um, it was, I think it was called tumbly or clicky, I can't remember, but um, it was adorable and really frustrating. But that's all they can do. They don't have any cleverer ways of swimming. So what do they do with this? Um, if they're moving towards something good or away from something bad, we call that like chemotaxis. They're going moving relative to a chemical. And they typically are going to use this to, to get to nutrients. But other times they're going to use it to get to a better location. Like, for example, when an E. coli strain is is um, in the middle of a, if it's infected someone's urethra and it's trying to find its way to the bladder, it's going to sense something that's present in urine. Um, one of the, I think, serine, a strange serine molecule is present in urine. And so it's going to look for that and follow that upstream towards the bladder. Um, so that's not going towards nutrients, it's looking for a better place to live. And then phototaxis is the same idea, but they're moving towards light. Okay, so that's taxis, chemotaxis, flagella. These are fimbriae. These are short, thin, adhesive um, protein things that stick off of cells. So I don't know if you can see that, but these little tiny things this is a scanning electron microscopy picture, or scanning, scanning electron micrograph, where they're showing you the fimbriae. Um, and they're very numerous, and they would allow a cell to stick to a, to a cell. So this bacterial cell could stick to one of your epithelial cells. Or the cells could stick together, and they could form a mat on the surface of water, called a pellicle. Um, so that's what fimbriae do. Pili uh, need to have a singular form because often they, there's only one per cell. These are like fimbriae, but sometimes thicker and much longer, and there would only be one or two of them. Um, and they have different functions. There are different types of pilus with different functions. And I, I just want you to know these functions. 
they can carry DNA between cells. So this cell might be injecting DNA into this cell. That's a plasmid with an antibiotic resistance gene moving from, I don't know, from one population of cells to the other. Some cells use this to move electrons out of the cell towards an electron accepting molecule. And we'll talk about that in lecture three and lecture four. And then some of them can drag themselves across the surface using a pillus. So let's see, that's the pillus. Um, the glycocalyx is the layer of uh, carbohydrates that surrounds some cells. They're excreted, but they, they, um, they don't really leave the cell. So if they're covalently attached to the cell, we call it a capsule. And if they're loosely attached, we call it a slime layer. Somebody gave me this slide and I forgot it had that animation, but that was entertaining. Um, what you're seeing here is what's called a capsule stain. It is a negative stain. So what that means is the, the pigment or the dye is the dark stuff here and a different dye was used to stain the bacteria. And the glycocalyx repels the dye. So if you, or repels the pigment, so it makes these light spaces and there's dark in between them. So that's kind of cool. And what you can see is that the, the capsule might be much bigger than the bacteria itself. Um, so what are the functions? Why would they make a layer of carbohydrates or polysaccharides around them, it camouflages them. It makes it hard for them to be phagocytosed by macrophages or neutrophils or dendritic cells. Um, it also prevents uh, proteins from binding to them. So an antibody, it turns out we don't make antibodies very well against carbohydrates. We make antibodies against proteins. And so if a cell wraps itself in carbohydrates, our antibodies will just bounce off of it. So from our point of view, these things kind of suck. Um, they, um, they also help attach and they help the cell avoid drying out. And they're probably older than humans or vertebrates. So they're older than um, immune systems. So they probably originally evolved to protect these bacteria from being eaten by protists and stuff. And that is it for bacterial cell structures in lecture two. Um, the last slide here is a concept map. And this is something I want you to start using when you study, if you haven't already, where if you have a lot of different words and you're having trouble keeping them straight or knowing what they do, as you study, connect the words, just lay them out here and connect them using a verb so that one is the subject and one is the object of a sentence. And that verb tells you their relationship. Like external structures include flagella, they include pili, they include a glycocalyx. The glycocalyx consists of a slime layer or it could consist of a capsule. And you could have another thing like slime layer is um, and this would be loosely attached. Capsule is covalently attached. Um, this is kind of simple because you can wor use words like consists of, includes, is. But if you're studying something complex like DNA synthesis or how a, how a ribosome works and you're looking at all the different parts and how they interact, it's going to be more complicated and more useful. This is a tool for studying complicated things and things that work together. So um, when you're doing ANP3, for example, um, presumably you did some of this, or if you didn't, maybe it would have helped. Okay, so that is that. In the next video will be some math and a sock. <laughs>